Today we have a generalized Fresnel integral. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of x to the n with respect to x where n is greater than 1. And the other Fresnel integral is that from 0 to infinity of the cosine of x to the n with respect to x. And the solution development for the sine version is almost exactly the same as that for the cosine version. The only, there's only one difference, one slight difference, and you'll figure that out halfway through today's video in which we're going to be evaluating the sine version, which I'm going to call I sub n. Okay, so let's get started. First up, let's perform a substitution going from the x world to the u world where we let x to the n equal to u, which implies that x equals u to the 1 by n. And this further implies that dx equals 1 by n u to the 1 by n minus 1 du, which we can write as 1 by n times u to the 1 minus 1 by n du. And the reason for that will become clear shortly. It'll just look better for our solution development. Anyway, so as per our transformation, I sub n now equals the integral from 0 to infinity because the limits of integration are clearly not bothered by our, by our transformation. So we have 1 by n times this integral from 0 to infinity of sine of u divided by u to the 1 minus 1 by n du. And because u and x are just dummy variables, we can rename all the, all the u's to x's and we're back into the x world where we're now interested in 1 by n times the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x to the 1 minus 1 by n dx. Now our line of attack for this integral is quite similar to the time I evaluated the generalized Dirichlet integral. Link in the description below. Do check that out if you haven't because it's the most awesome thing on YouTube. Anyway, uh, self-praise aside, sorry about that. We're going to define an integral i to be that from 0 to infinity of t to the n minus 1 times e to the negative t dt, which you'll recognize as the gamma function. But we're going to introduce a parameter x as part of the argument of the exponential function. And now we're going to perform a substitution where we let x times t equal to u, which implies that dt equals 1 by x times du. And this transforms our integral into that from 0 to infinity. Again, the limits are not bothered by our transformation of u to the n minus 1 divided by x to the n minus 1 times e to the negative u du by x. And we can take these x terms outside of the integral because they're independent of u or they're just constants in the u world, that is. So we have 1 by x to the n times the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the n minus 1 times e to the negative u du, which we recognize again as the gamma function. So this implies that i equals gamma n divided by x to the n, which implies that 1 by x to the n equals 1 by gamma n times this integral here, which is the, oh, sorry about that, messed up the n, which is the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the n minus 1 times e to the negative xt dt. Okay, so what exactly are we going to make of this integral representation of 1 by x to the n? Well, recall that i sub n is 1 by n times the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x to the 1 minus 1 by n dx. So all we have to do here is replace the n by a 1 minus 1 by n. So that means 1 by x to the 1 minus 1 by n equals the reciprocal of gamma 1 minus 1 by n times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the, well, n minus 1 is just negative 1 by n, right? So we have t to the negative 1 by n times e to the negative xt dt. 
So this implies that we can write I sub n as 1 by n times the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x multiplied by this integral representation. So we have 1 by this gamma function. Now this gamma function is just a constant with respect to integration, right? So let's just take it outside of the integration operator. And inside the integration operator, we have uh, the sine of x times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the negative 1 by n times e to the negative xt integration with respect to t, and you're integrating all of this with respect to x. Next up, notice that sine of x is independent of the t variable, so we can just slip it in to this integration with respect to t operator. I'm going to write all this stuff outside here more compactly as alpha sub n. So we have i sub n being equal to alpha sub n times the integral from 0 to infinity, the double integral from 0 to infinity, infinity that is, of sine x times t to the negative 1 by n times e to the negative xt, integration first with respect to t and then with respect to x. And the golden question here, as you would expect by now, is can we switch up the order of integration? Well, we have sine of x, and we have t to the negative 1 by n, and we're taking n to be greater than 1, and we have another exponential damping factor here. So yeah, there are no problems regarding continuity or boundedness, so using Fubini's theorem, yes, we can switch up the order of integration, and we're now integrating with respect to x first, and then with respect to t. Now, the perk of this is that because we're integrating first with respect to x, this t, uh, this t to the negative 1 by n term is independent of x, so we can slip it outside this integration with respect to x. So we have alpha sub n times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the negative 1 by n times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative xt times sine of x dx, and we have this outer integration with respect to t now. And this integration here is quite easy to carry out using some basic complex analysis. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative xt times the sine of x dx. And this can be written as the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative xt times e to the ix using Euler's wonderful formula. And this simplifies out to the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x times t minus i dx. And this evaluates to exactly this term divided by the negative of t minus i, with the limits being 0 and infinity. Now, as x approaches infinity, you have this e to the negative xt term, which approaches 0 as x approaches infinity. So the entire thing collapses to 0 in that limit, and as x approaches 0, you get 1 upstairs, and you can get rid of the negative sign because you have to subtract the values you get at the upper and lower limits. Okay, so you need the imaginary part of this complex number, and you can find that by expanding using the conjugate. So you have t plus i upstairs and t squared minus i squared downstairs. So we have the imagine we need the imaginary part of t plus i divided by t squared plus 1, which is of course 1 by 1 plus t squared. Okay, cool. So this implies that i sub n equals alpha sub n times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the negative 1 by n divided by 1 plus t squared dt. And the structure we have is highly suggestive of the beta function. So let's perform a change of variable where we let t squared equal, I don't know, phi, which implies that t equals the square root of phi, which further implies that dt equals 1 by 2 times the square root of phi, d phi. Okay. 
Okay, nice. And this means that our integral i sub n equals alpha sub n times the integral again from 0 to infinity of t to the negative 1 by, oh, sorry about that. We're in the phi world now. So phi to the negative 1 by 2 n. Uh, you have this factor 1 by 2 outside because of the differential element. You have phi to the negative 1 half. So let's just write all of this as negative 1 by 2 n minus 1 half d phi upstairs and we have um, 1 plus phi downstairs and now we can actually apply the second in integral representation of the beta function now the beta function with complex arguments u and v is the integral from 0 to infinity of phi to the v minus 1 d phi divided by 1 plus phi to the u plus v. So comparing the exponents, we find that v minus 1 equals uh, negative 1 by 2 n uh, minus 1 by 2. And yeah, I'm out of writing space. I did not even notice that. Okay, cool. Zoom back in. Um, v minus 1 equals negative 1 by 2 n minus 1 half. So this implies that v equals uh, 1 half plus, or I'll just write it as 1 half times 1 plus 1 by n. Yeah, that looks nice. And downstairs we see that u plus v equals 1, which implies that u equals 1 minus 1 half of 1 plus 1 one by n. Okay, cool. That means our integral i sub n equals alpha sub n divided by 2 times the beta function evaluated at u being 1 minus 1 half of 1 plus 1 by n. Uh, and the second argument is 1 half of 1 plus 1 by n. Okay, cool. And now we're about to employ the only use of the beta function and that is to summon its cousin the gamma function. In terms of the gamma function we have alpha sub n by 2 times gamma 1 minus 1 half of 1 plus 1 by n times gamma of this stuff. Okay cool we get the point now divided by gamma of the sum of all of the stuff and when you add up the two arguments we see that we only are left with gamma 1, which is 1 anyway. And you're left with a structure in which you can apply the awesome reflection formula for the gamma function. So we know Euler's wonderful reflection formula. It's gamma z times uh, gamma 1 minus z being equal to pi times the cosecant of pi z. So this implies that our integral i sub n equals alpha sub n by 2 times pi times the cosecant of pi by 2 plus pi by 2n. Okay, cool. That seems like a nice result. And because of this phase shift, you can write this as a secant. So you're left with the, you're left with pi times the secant of pi by 2n. And now recalling exactly what our alpha term was, it was in fact, um, you have this factor of 1 by 2 already, and alpha sub n was in fact 1 by n times gamma 1 minus 1 by n. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was exactly that. And we have pi up here, writing this more neatly, pi divided by all of this junk times the secant of pi by 2n, which is quite a nice result, but let's see if this even works by plugging in the well-known result for n being equal to 2. So i sub 2 equals pi divided by 2 times 2 is 4, and we have pi 1 minus 1 half, which is just gamma 1 half, which is the square root of pi, we all know that, times the secant of pi by 4, which is, of course, the square root of 2. So pi divided by the square root of pi is just the square root of pi. And we can write this as the square root of 2 divided by 16, which is 1 by 8. So our result 
implies that the integral from zero to infinity of the sine of x squared with respect to x equals pi by eight as expected. So yeah, the formula works quite nicely. And this is a pretty cool generalization for the Fresnel integrals. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.